hey guys, I wanted to tell you about this vaginal breach delivery we just did. Oh wow, a singleton breach delivery? I've only done a breach extraction of a second twin. Yeah, what happened? How did she present? So she was a multiparous patient, came in, was quickly six centimeters. On her cervical check, there was concern that she was in breach presentation, which we confirmed on an ultrasound. So we talked to her about a recommendation for a C-section, um, which she agreed to, so we quickly moved to the OR. Did she have an epidural? No, she didn't. And after spinal anesthesia was placed and the nurse was placing the Foley, the feet were at the introitus. So you really only had one choice at that point. You had to deliver in breach presentation. Exactly. And our team was fantastic and well-prepared and everything went well, but that obviously wasn't our first choice for delivery for her. Yeah, at least you were in L&D. Um, the only breach delivery I've ever done has been in the ED. I've never done a singleton breach delivery. Well, we should go over who are good candidates for breach delivery and practice the maneuvers to ensure a safety, safe delivery. For sure. Even if a patient comes in progressing quickly in breach presentation and refuses a cesarean delivery, we absolutely need to know how to deliver that. Definitely. That's a great idea. The good news is trial of labor for a desired vaginal breach delivery is a safe option as long as certain criteria are met. Obviously, we wouldn't attempt a breach delivery if vaginal delivery in general was thought to be unsafe for the patient or the fetus. The trial of labor must be carried out in a facility equipped and staffed for emergent cesarean delivery, and a clinician experienced in breach delivery must be present to supervise the labor and delivery course. Ideally, the facility in which the birth is to occur should also have a protocol in place for vaginal breach delivery. There are a few other factors we should assess to determine if the patient is a candidate for a safe attempt at vaginal breach delivery. We need an ultrasound providing a reliable estimate of fetal weight ranging 2,500 grams to 3,800 grams. Ultrasound should also ensure that the presentation is either complete or frank breach. We don't ever plan a vaginal delivery for a footing breach. Again, using ultrasound, we need to verify that the fetal neck is not extended. Fetal monitoring to date cannot show any indication of fetal compromise. The pre-MOTA trial found that outcomes were best in patients with adequate pelvimetry. However, this is uncommonly measured in patients, either clinically or radiographically. As such, the importance of pelvimetry in the decision to pursue a vaginal breach delivery is unclear. If we're good so far, we can obtain informed consent. In addition to risks of cesarean delivery, the patient should be counseled that there is a slightly increased risk of perinatal mortality and short-term neonatal morbidity in vaginal breach delivery. We're talking about two per 1,000 births. Inform her that emergency cesarean delivery accounts for most of the risk, but may be required in up to 40% of women who attempt a vaginal breach delivery. During labor, there are some recommended practices we should carefully observe. Continuous external fetal monitoring should be in place. The labor curve should be assessed and found to be progressing normally. Epidural is recommended because it decreases the urge to push too soon, helps with pain if invasive maneuvers are required for delivery, and will speed time to incision if emergent cesarean is necessary. There is a small chance having an epidural could increase the need for intervention. Artificial rupture of membranes should be delayed until the patient is complete, as there is a threefold higher risk of cord prolapse and compression with a breech delivery. We should be prepared with piper forceps in the room in case we need to intervene quickly. Finally, NICU should be present at delivery. A critical element in the execution of the safe breech vaginal delivery is to allow maternal effort alone to deliver the baby up to the level of the umbilicus. Interventions such as trunk rotation or extraction of the limbs may be performed as necessary, but traction on the fetal trunk should be absolutely avoided. In the next few scenarios, we'll run over some of the most common and effective maneuvers to facilitate the safe breech vaginal delivery. In the setting of a complete breech, maternal effort alone should be sufficient to deliver the fetal trunk and lower extremities. In the setting of an incomplete or frank breech, interventions such as the Pinard maneuver may be necessary to facilitate delivery of the lower extremities. The Pinard maneuver is begun when maternal effort has delivered the baby to the level of the umbilicus. The maneuver is accomplished by the practitioner sliding their hand along the lower extremity, placing gentle pressure in the popliteal fossa, rotating the limb away from the trunk while rotating the trunk in the opposite direction to facilitate knee flexion and delivery. The maneuver may be repeated on the opposite side as necessary. At this point, maternal effort alone should be used to deliver the fetus to the level of the scapula. The majority of the time, the fetus will deliver with the shoulders in an anterior-posterior plane and the upper extremities will deliver spontaneously. In the event the fetus presents in the transverse plane or in the case of a nuchal arm, operator assistance may again become necessary to allow for delivery of the upper extremities. This can be accomplished with the Loveset Maneuver. This maneuver is accomplished by holding the fetus by the hips and trunk 
with care to avoid placing pressure on the fetal kidneys and adrenal. Wrapping the hips in a sterile towel may allow the operator to maintain a more steady grip. While maintaining a gentle grip, the baby is first rotated 90 degrees into the anterior posterior plane to allow for spontaneous delivery of the first arm. The baby is then rotated 180 degrees in the opposite direction to allow for delivery of the remaining extremity. Should this arm remain entrapped, the operator may again intervene by guiding their hand down the extremity, placing gentle pressure into the antecubital fossa and sweeping the arm down across the baby's face and chest to allow for delivery. In the majority of breech vaginal deliveries, maternal effort in combination with suprapubic pressure to encourage flexion of the fetal neck is sufficient for delivery of the aftercoming head. In the event the aftercoming head does not deliver spontaneously, application of the Marisot smelly vite maneuver may aid in delivery. At this time, the fetal trunk is allowed to rest along the arm of the operator's dominant hand with the legs straddling the forearm. An assistant may help elevate the fetal trunk to allow for access to the posterior aspect of the vagina. The dominant hand is inserted into the posterior aspect of the vagina with the pads of the three middle fingers being used to place gentle pressure along the fetal maxilla and malar eminences in combination with pressure on the occiput from the non-dominant hand, fetal head flexion is encouraged. Now, gentle outward traction is used to deliver the aftercoming head. In the event the Marisot smelly vite maneuver fails to deliver the aftercoming head, episiotomy in combination with Piper forceps may be considered to deliver the entrapped fetal head. Prior to any forceps delivery, Phantom application to ensure appropriate articulation of the blades is important. This is a pelvic forceps application, and as such, adequate access to the posterior vagina is very important. For this reason, most practitioners find it helpful to take a knee during placement of the forceps blades. With aid from an assistant, the fetus is elevated to allow for access to the posterior vagina with important care not to exceed 45 degrees of elevation. The maternal left blade is always placed first and at this time, the fetus is displaced slightly towards maternal right. With the operator's right hand being slid into the vagina, the blade with the shank against the maternal right leg is then swung in a wide arc to allow for the blade to slide past the fetal chin and ear. At this time, the infant is displaced towards maternal left and the process is repeated on the right side. Once the blades are safely articulated, a maternal safety tissue check is performed and the fetal trunk is allowed to rest upon the blades. At this time, the dominant hand is used to grasp the forceps and the non-dominant hand is placed along the fetal occiput to encourage fetal head flexion. In combination with suprapubic pressure, gentle traction on the forceps, and anterior displacement, the delivery of the aftercoming head is accomplished. Wow, going through all that really makes me feel better about vaginal breech deliveries. Me too, there's a lot to remember. I think we could do with some more practice. I agree, this is an uncommon situation, so frequent simulation is important to be prepared. Yeah, and I've had several patients who have failed external cephalic version and they just didn't want a C-section. I've had patients who would be great candidates for a trial of labor as well. I'd love to be able to offer them that choice.